Welcome back to the PLC Professor's Video Library. If this is your first visit, a brief introduction will a brief introduction to our resources will help you out. Uh, we started out with a lecture series that developed out of classroom lectures. We then created a 200 page lab project manual that covers all 71 instructions supported by a very inexpensive PLC and it had to be a PLC that had free programming software. Then we added three more video series to actually discuss those lab projects. We broke it into three sections, basics, advanced one, and advanced two. And it also goes over the project results and provides the answers for the fill in the blank areas in the manual. These four series, that is the lectures and the three lab summaries series can be found on the YouTube channel in the playlist or if you have the disc well the discs are divided if you have the disc then uh, they're divided up into those four series these four series can be found on the YouTube channel um, if YouTube's still in existence in the area of playlist this particular presentation that we're going to do today uh, would be found in the playlist Basic Physics Electricity Magnetism and it is part three on just basic principles. There are other playlists, Training Support, PLC Communications, which has the RS Links, RS Logics 5000 and more. Uh, we are almost complete with our new manual that's on RS Logics 5000. Today, the principal's lecture is on the electrical properties of backplanes. This presentation was created in support of a how to series on building an advanced PLC trainer, but this lecture stands alone just as a principal. Okay, backplanes. What is a backplane? Now, if you already know what a backplane is, uh, this lecture may be of interest. If you are extremely familiar with backplanes, you may want to breeze through this and go on to the next one. So you put the word back and plane together, what do you get? Here you have a backplane from an industrial computer chassis. It's called a backplane because it's flat and it's in the back of the chassis that holds the modules. Notice the fine horizontal lines with, period, with periodic groupings of soldered connections. So as you look from left to right or right to left, you see a pattern of horizontal lines that uh, bend their way around or bend their way to solder connections. So this uh, collection of horizontal lines that are... Um, acquired by solder connections is generally generally referred to as the backplane and of course the backplane is really a circuit board that is mounted in the back of a chassis and when you slide in modules the modules engage into connectors the solder joints of which you see here so all these little um, greenish yellow amber dots are solder connections on the other side of this board in the area where you see the yellow outline is a connector. So we're looking at the back of the back plane, not the front. And these, these copper lines or these horizontal lines, they are called copper traces. They're running parallel and they run the length of the circuit board, each electrically isolated from the other. Think of each narrow trace of copper as a piece of copper with an electrical state. So if there were 48 copper traces running across that back plane, each one of them is totally electrically isolated from the other. They are actually little thin uh, traces of copper on this insulating board. Okay, let's discuss one of those copper traces on the back plane, a piece of copper. Consider it 
just a piece of copper. Now, we all know that everything in the universe is made up of molecules, and all molecules are made up of atoms. And in this case, we're interested in copper, which is the best conductor. And copper, as all conductors, has only one electron in the outer ring or the valence ring of the atom. That's what gives it the properties of being a conductor. That means that that electron in the outer orbit is easily dislodged for movement through the material. So to move some electrons around, we're going to start out with a battery. Now, I have no particular affiliation with Duracell Plus. I just happened to grab this image to use in my illustration, but everybody recognizes this as a 9 volt DC battery. And it is actually truly a battery because it is a battery of cells. Now don't go around correcting everybody, but um, AA, AAA, they are cells. They're not batteries, but we call them batteries. A battery is two or more, like a battery of artillery. So this is a 9 volt battery. If you break one of these apart, it has six cells and they're all wired in series. <clears throat> so we're going to start out with this battery and let's say that this battery needs a charge. So let's give it one. To do that we need a charger. So we get a battery charger. A charger has two charges. One charge has an excess of electrons and is negative with a minus sign whereas the other charge has a, de a deficiency of electrons and is positive with a plus sign. So you can look at the two terminals on that charger, the black marked minus or negative and the red marked plus or positive. The black terminal, its volume is full of extra electrons, which means in the atomic structure in that area of the charger, there are more electrons than there should be to electrically balance the atomic structure. And then on the other side, the red side, with a plus sign, and by the way, the plus and minus are basically misconceptions, I think started with Ben Franklin. So a plus normally means you have more and a minus means you have less. So in conventional current flow, they have current flowing from plus to minus. But we're going to talk electron flow because it's really the only way to understand what is happening at the atomic level. So the minus side, the black side, has a excess of electrons and the red side, all of those atoms in there are quite a few of them, they're missing an electron. They want one to be electrically neutral. So an atom missing an electron is a positive ion and it sends out a field trying to draw in an electron to balance itself. On the negative side, all of those atoms, they're happy. Matter of fact, all those electrons over there, they don't belong there. And two electrons repel each other, so that mass of extra electrons over there, they're fighting to get out and get back over to the red side. So the battery is designed with two isolated regions, one that accepts extra electrons and one that will give up electrons to create a deficiency. So we want to pass this excess to one side of the battery, remove electrons from the other side into the plus side on the charger to create a deficiency over there. And then we want to take this battery as a portable source of charges and then use it for something. Now we connect the electrically neutral or discharged battery by copper pieces to the source of electrons and to the source of deficiency of electrons. The instant that we make this final connection, the source of extra electrons pushes electrons into the left side of the battery and every time an electron goes in the left side, one pops out the right side. So if you like, 
you can think of this <clears throat> process as taking a flat tire and you have a it, it would be called a reservoir but you think of it as an air tank so you take your air compressor you plug it in you let it get up to 80 psi and then you unplug it you put it in the trunk of your car and you go somewhere where there's a flat tire so you've got a tank with 80 psi in it you've got a flat tire that's at atmospheric pressure or we'll say zero it's not really zero but it's at atmospheric pressure so you connect up this compressed air tank the, the compressor doesn't count anymore because it's unplugged you've got 80 psi to work with at that volume you plug it into the tire you know connect it by way of a hose to the valve stem immediately because the tire is at a lower pressure than the compressed air tank air starts flowing now as air flows from the tank to the tire the pressure in the tank drops the pressure in the tire raises and at some point it will balance and if you have ever done this let's say that you're down to 35 psi and the tires at 34.9 there's still some air flowing but it is barely flowing because there's hardly any pressure left differential to push the air in there to balance the two volumes so if you left that tire and that tank connected long enough at some point the two would be totally equal and would be one volume of air now this is a little bit different because our charger is not temporary as electrons push you in the negative side of the battery and electrons come out the positive side they, they circulate through the charger and the power coming from the outlet that comes from the utility company it keeps the voltage the pressure of the charger up so we want to charge this battery up to 9 volts so we need to keep the charger at at least 9 volts it can't decrease in pressure as the battery fills up okay so once the pressures are equal there is nothing left to motivate the air molecules I mean in the tank the same thing here once the pressure is equal then there's nothing left to push electrons in or pull electrons out and the system is balanced at this point the battery is fully charged and can be removed from the charger once the battery is fully charged it is of use elsewhere okay here's our piece of copper and um, that's as close as I could get to the color of copper with the palette in this software so here we have a fully charged battery and a piece of copper um, could be a thin trace on the back plane of a computer circuit card could just be a plain sheet of copper it could be a copper wire but the fact that there's nothing touching it but white on the screen means that it's insulated from the rest of the world other than air and air is a really good insulator so this is just a piece of copper whether it's a trace on the back plane or a sheet or a wire and then we connect the battery to the piece of copper with another piece of copper to expose the electrically neutral piece of copper to the excess of electrons in the battery the battery terminal is more negative than the piece of copper so electrons move from the battery out into the piece of copper spreading out as far apart as they can get from each other like charges repel two electrons repel each other this continues until the piece of copper has the same charge that the negative side of the battery has actually this does very very slightly discharge the battery however at the point where this stops the distribution of electrons in this piece of copper balances with the distribution in the battery so it only takes a, a split microsecond for this to occur so you really didn't discharge the battery it's like connecting a wire a copper wire from the negative side of the battery if you take a one foot piece of copper wire right now and connect it to the negative side of a 9 volt DC battery that copper wire is going to become charged not a heavy charge 
but basically that copper wire now represents the negative terminal of that battery. To do that, it has to have extra electrons in it. So you could say that any conductor attached to the terminal of a battery or any voltage source represents that terminal no matter how large or how long the conductor is. If this piece of copper in a, is a thin wire one mile long, the far end of it is electrically the same as the terminal of the battery that it is connected to. Now there is some time involved from the time you take this one mile long piece of copper wire, attach it to the negative side of the battery and it fills up with electrons. But we're talking microseconds. Okay, let's do this from the other direction. Here we have a fully charged battery and a piece of copper. It could be a thin trace on the back plane of a computer circuit card or just a plain sheet of copper or a copper wire. It's just a piece of copper. Either way, it is electrically neutral, meaning that all of the atoms are balanced. That is, each atom has an equal number of electrons and protons. It is balanced and there is no net charge on the piece of copper. And then we connect the battery to the piece of copper. Only this time we connect it to the positive side of the power supply, the positive terminal. Now remember the positive side is missing, we'll just say it's missing 10 million electrons because these things are small. So the positive side of the battery is missing 10 million electrons. The piece of copper isn't missing any. However, that positive charge is so strong it reaches in the piece of copper and starts pulling out electrons. And if you waited for a long, long time, eventually you would have 5 million electrons missing from that piece of copper to balance the difference between the positive terminal and that piece of uh, copper that was neutral. Okay, this continues until the piece of copper has the same charge distribution that the positive side of the battery has. Once we have balanced the deficiency between the piece of copper and the positive terminal, if we disconnect the little piece of copper or the conductor that connected the positive terminal to the piece of copper, nothing's going to happen and the same when we had charged that piece of copper with extra electrons. The charge stays on the piece of copper. So you could say it has a static charge even though the charge didn't get there by the normal means of producing stati static electricity. The fact that the charge is stationary and has no source to uh, perpetuate it if you start discharging it. So if you took this piece of copper that's charged up positive and by the way if you touch the negative side of the battery electrons would come out of that battery balance that piece of copper and then continue pumping electrons in it until it matched the negative side of the battery. So all we're trying to do here is to give you a sense of how a conductor responds to electromotive force. Electromotive force EMF the force that motivates electrons, which is a charge difference, positive to negative, negative to positive, however you like to call it. So, and I've said this before, you could say that any conductor attached to the terminal of a battery or source of voltage represents that terminal no matter how large or how long the conductor is. If this piece of copper is a thin wire one mile long, the far end of it is electrically the same as the terminal of the source that it is connected to. If we disconnect the piece of copper from the battery, the two were equal in EMF so nothing happens between them when you disconnect. This will leave the piece of copper with a charge equal to one side of the battery. No real capacity for flow but equal. So the charge is not it's equal to that of the battery, but if you start discharging it, it's going to disappear in a hurry. And of course this goes to the same thing for a piece of copper that's charged up positive. 
So again, the pieces of copper were charged, but the capacity is extremely low. That's the difference between a, we'll say, um, nine, one and a half volt batteries wired in series, which would give you 12 volts DC. We'll, we'll even make them um, A cells or D cells. We'll make them the big fat one and a half volt batteries that you use two of them in a big flashlight. If you take nine of those and put them in series, nine times one and a half is 12, basically. Well, it's not exactly, but let's see, nine plus four and a half, that's 13 and a half volts. Okay, but anyway, um, we'll say that you put a number of batteries, the D size, in series to get up near 12 volts. Well, a 12 volt car battery has thousands of times more electrons available at that pressure. So the difference would be if you took and had a one quart tank, steel tank, and you charged it up to 80 psi. Then you took a 10 gallon tank and charged it up to 10 psi. The 10 gallon tank would take a lot longer to charge up to 80 psi because there's more volume. Whereas the little one, one quart size, it's not going to take long to charge it up. But when you go to discharge them, the one quart size, or one fourth of a gallon, it's going to lose its pressure very quick. Whereas the 10 gallon is going to be able to charge up a lot of tires before it runs out of pressure. So keep in mind that there's a voltage and then there's also capacity. So these little pieces of copper, they're charged equal to the battery in terms of EMF, but they dissipate almost instantaneously when they come in contact with anything. So touching either of these two pieces of copper, one charge negative or one charge positive, to earth ground, to like a water pipe, or if you were to take these two copper plates, positive and negative, and touch them together, the one that was negative would give up all of its extra electrons to balance out the one that was positive and you end up with a neutral, a neutral or an equal balance. So a conductor or really any object can either be positive, negative or neutral. Okay, thank you for watching. Uh, and other principles on electricity and magnetism. And we're going to make this part 3A. Um, I didn't realize this was going to take this long to go over this, and I don't like making the videos more than about 20 to 25 minutes. So we'll have a part 3B to continue on this lecture. So find part 3B and continue.